Our pursuit for equality and excellence was driven by desperation. There was nothing to return to if we failed. There was no safety net, no one to lean on for assistance. So we strove hard and burned the midnight lamp to be successful today. Brij Lal. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This film was inspired by a visit to my family in Fiji in 2006. After a 10 year absence when I discovered that an uncle from my wife's side of the family was a cane farmer. I decided to spend some time with him at his house in Lautoka. He had gathered about 8 Fijians to help him with the harvest. Every day he takes sugarcane to the mill and waits. It is about 8 to 10 p.m. before he returns to start their grueling routine all over again. Being a cane farmer is hard work. Every morning the gang wakes up around 4 a.m. to start cutting the cane, working until midday. Afterwards they break for lunch and wait for later afternoon, when the heat is less intense, to load the cane onto the truck. The islands of Fiji are home to many different races, Indians, mixed Europeans, Chinese, and other Pacific Islanders who, through the generations, have kept their cultural identities and heritages intact, still manage to live in harmony with one another. Native Fijians make up over 50% of the total population and are essential members of all the communities. All live together peacefully in the villages, working together to accomplish the things needed for their daily lives and not as segregated groups. So how did so many of India's people come to be on Fiji? The same way they were taken to Africa to build the transcontinental railroad through the wilds of that continent. After the early 1870s, when it was recognized worldwide that slavery was a crime against man, a new form of evil took its place, indentured servitude. From 1879 to 1916, Indians came to Fiji as these indentured laborers to work the lands for the sugar plantation owners. The term indentured labor was ultimately just a clever guise for the recently abolished slave trade. Many Indians stayed on Fiji as independent farmers and businessmen and helped Fiji grow. Today the families make up the second highest majority of the population at 43.6%. While I was spending time with my uncle, I decided to interview a few other people for my film, Warriors of Toil. You know about slaves? Yeah. The Africans who were brought to America, right. they came as slaves. Right. Slavery, eh? Uh -huh. Now when the slave system ended, then there was a need to replace that system with something else. You had to have cheap workers. And whites won't do the kind of work that you could make non-white people do. So the indenture system emerged as a result of that. They came in, this is a great opportunity. At least they were working. There's a, you know, there's a dignity in labor. So they came and worked and uh, it, so it was good for Fiji. Regardless of what we politicians make it out to be now, you know, I feel that uh, Fiji wouldn't be what it is if there had don't uh, there hadn't been that indentured uh, uh, laborers uh, part in the history of our development. I have taken the only option left to me, that is to go ahead and steer our beloved nation towards perhaps becoming a republic. At 10 o'clock this morning, members of the Royal Fiji Military Forces took over the government of Fiji. This is the fourth coup the people of Fiji have suffered through in just 19 years. When military commander Commodore Voringe Bainima Rama announced on December 15th 2006 that he had taken over executive authority and was now effectively in control of the islands, emotions ran high and mixed among the people. Other times, the coups were done in the name of the indigenous Fijian cause. The current leadership is anything but that. 
Why have Fiji's people suffered through these four coups in less than two decades? One must look at the history of Fiji for insight to the problems facing Fijians today. This is the story of Fiji and her adopted Indian sons. Perhaps, if you listen to their stories, you might hear the clue to finding the solution to the cycle of coups in Fiji. Bola, you see that stone? That's our execution stone. Eh? What happened in those days, there were no prison. So if you commit a crime, you rest your chin on the stone. You use a club, they bang the back of your head with the club, they put you in a pot, they make one big soup. Last cannibal in 1894, he's from Vanolewu, the last cannibal. That's the chief of Ra, Undre Undre. Yeah, he ate 99 people. But what about Fiji herself? Where did the climb that began with a group of islands inhabited by cannibals end up as the nation Fiji is today? From the discovery of the Fijian Islands in 1642 by Abel Tasman, early explorers knew Fiji to be dangerous, an unknown area inhabited by unpredictable cannibals and strewn with treacherous reefs. In short, a place one avoided. Explorers, such as James Cook and William Bly, chart the islands. However, it is not until the discovery of sandalwood that trade brings Europeans to Fiji. In 1807, in a world unknown to the natives of Fiji, a liberal group in Great Britain, led by the bold Christian William Wilberforce, succeeds in ending slavery in all of the British Empire. The slaves that had been kidnapped from Africa were now free but it also ends the supply of free labor on the sugar plantations in British South America and plantations around the world. Before long, those not wanting to pay wages for a day's work come up with another plan. With a simple rephrasing, slavery becomes indentureship and a systematic recruitment of India's poorest population is in full swing, promising to provide food, shelter, and even monetary compensation at the end of their contractual period, it was easy to sell the indentured labor agreement to impoverished and illiterate Indians. And what replaced the slave system was indenture. Now, indentured workers were not brought to Fiji first. They were taken to Caribbean first to replace the slaves, the African slaves. In Fiji, the indenture system started about 50 years after the indentured workers went to the Caribbean, Guyana, you know, the entire Caribbean area. So it was virtual slavery in that sense. And they also did not want to disrupt the Fijian communal system too much. Uh, they didn't want to take the Fijian workers away from the village because when they were doing that before the arrival of the endangered uh, Indian laborers, the Fijians from the village were getting paid. They'd go and work for the European farmers, uh, for the sugar companies, and got paid at the weekends. And because they had pay, they, they had opportunities to buy liquor. And they were drinking alcohol in the village or near the villages, disrupting the social structure. So it was better for the colonial government and the colonial sugar refining company uh, cooperatively to get in better workers who were used to working. The Fijians are not used to working. You know, you don't, there is no work time. You go to work when you're ready. You come home when you feel like coming home. There was no eight to four type thing and no day shift, no night shift. So when they brought in these uh, workers from India who were prepared to work, who wanted to get a, make, a better, uh, make a better life for themselves and their families, it was a big change for themselves, you know? They came in, this is a great opportunity. But the point to make is this, that the arrival of Indian people saved the Fijian community from certain disaster. Indians worked on the plantations, contributed to the revenue of the colony, contributed to the development of the colony, and that ensured that Fijian way of life remained undisturbed. Had Indians not come, had Fijians been recruited to work on plantations, can you imagine the disruptions to their way of life, 
to their cultural values and so on. So in this sense, I think the, the preservation of Fijian way of life is, is, is directly uh, influenced by the introduction of Indian indented labors. The 19th century brings the introduction of firearms to Fiji, as well as the first missionaries. Tribal conflicts are common at this time. Starting with the siege of Suva, in which 400 are killed, the Mbau Rewa Wars rage from 1843 to 1855, beginning typically over something minor. In this case, the dispute is over a pig. During this period, son of exiled Vunivalu, Tanoa Visiwanga, Seru, now called Thakumbau, wields power with the people of Mbau. His military efforts lead him into conflict with newly converted Christian tribal chiefs and their missionary supporters. In the face of increasing opposition from European Christians, and the failure of a critical attack on the enemy, Thakombau heeds the warning to think wisely these days and converts to Lotu, as the Fijians called Christianity. The American Civil War makes Sea Island cotton precious in the markets of the world, adding to Fiji's economic attraction to Europeans. The 1860s and 70s see massive immigration from the Polynesia Company's settlers, and European planters arrive by the thousands to the fertile lands of the islands. They buy land for plantations from the native Fijians, sometimes under fraudulent terms, and often for guns and whiskey. Claims and counterclaims follow. With no legal system to decide the disputes, Fiji is swept to the brinks of a race war. In 1865, a confederacy of native kingdoms is established. The first constitution is signed by the seven independent chiefs of Fiji, representing the states of Mbau, Lakembo, Rewa, Mbua, Thakaundrove, Mathuata, and Nanduri. Thako Mbau is elected the first president. In 1867, Maafu seeks the seat but the Fijian chiefs refused to be governed by a Tongan. In 1868, the Australian Polynesia Company is formed. The company agrees to clear Thakumbau's debt to the Americans. In return, they receive the rights to trade in Fiji and a large piece of land. While it is not his land to trade, he has the Suva villagers relocate and welcomes a new group of Australians in 1870. 1870 sees the ratification of the Lakuva Charter. This gives the settlers the authority to enforce the established municipal regulations they helped bring about. But the charter is soon voided by a letter from the Governor of New South Wales, Australia, saying he does not have the authority to pass laws over Europeans. With the falling price of cotton, the plantations need to find a cheaper source of labour. Now the villagers of Livonia are auctioned off as slaves instead of being eaten. The um, Fiji was importing uh, indentured labor from the Pacific Islands, uh, from the Solomons uh, from, from, and from other Pacific Islands. But the problem was that they're twofold. One was that the Pacific Island labor trade was morally tainted because people felt, uh, and particularly missionaries reported, that this was a, essentially a blood-soaked kind of trade and should stop. Uh, and and, and that was the first reason. The second reason is that the kind of economic development that Sir Arthur Gordon had in mind when he became the governor of Fiji in 1875 uh, required an enormous injection of capital and labor and it was felt that Pacific Island labor uh, supply would not be enough. By June 1871, Thakumbau announces the establishment of a government complete with ministers. However, as a historian noted, 
the ministers could not satisfy the irreconcilable demands of merchants, planters, and Fijians. By 1873, there are three factions vying for control of Fiji. The Americans, the Polynesia Company, and Great Britain herself. But when the British pay off the Fijian debt to the United States, the Polynesia Company fades, keeping only a small fraction of the land they had sought. On October 10, 1874, the Council of Chiefs gives Fiji unreservedly to the Queen of England. In May, Fiji's colonial secretary, John B. Thurston, persuades the CSR to extend its operation into Fiji by making available to them 2,000 acres of land to establish their own plantations, thereby shielding the company from influxes in the market price of the raw cane. In 1880, the CSR, Colonial Sugar Refining Company, begins operations in Fiji. Uh, 1874, 1875, 76 was the land, land claims tribunal where Wilkinson went around Fiji and said, whose land is this? Mine. Whose land is this? The European says, that's mine. How did you get it? I bought it. What did you, uh, how much did you pay? Oh, I gave them one bottle of rum or something. Okay, from where? From this point to that mountain. So they recorded that and then they came back and surveyed it and both sides agreed, yep, Gona Kaivalangi, Gona Nongo, this is theirs, this is mine. And after that, they realized that 17% of the Fijian land had already been alienated, or part of it was not claimed. Whose part is this? No, nobody. Nobody claimed it. So it was put as Crown Schedule A. Nobody claimed it. And then there were other land which was seen in Nivingo, or it belonged to so-and-so, they're all dead. That was Crown Schedule B, uh, land that was identified as belonging to a landowning unit, but they had all gone extinct, they, everybody has died. So all that land make up the 17% that I'm talking about. 83% is tribally or uh, owned by the Matangalis in Fiji. On October 28, 1876, Sir Arthur Gordon issues a proclamation pardoning all hill tribes bringing to an end all the wars in Vichy Levu. He institutes a policy to keep Fiji in the hands of the Fijians by prohibiting the sale of land to non-natives, although still allowing the land to be leased. This policy continues virtually unchanged today, with around 93% of the land still in Fijian hands. Another part also banned the exploitation of natives as a source of cheap slave labor. The rulings of the proclamation contribute to Indian Fijians' problems to this day. When Fiji became a crown colony in 1874, Sir Arthur Gordon passed a number of, 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 of legislations that effectively determined the future of Fiji. He decided that Fijians should be prohibited from commercial employment on plantations because he felt that that was, would be disastrous for them or, or, or lead to you know, the loss of the culture, their way of life and so on and so forth. He also decided that, that land, uh, as much land should remain in Fijian hands as possible because a, a, a people uh, you know, without land uh, you, you know, uh, would, would face a, a ruinous future. So, and he also decided that, that Fijians should pay tax not in cash, but in kind. And, and he involved indigenous Fijians in the governance of, of the indigenous community. So indigenous Fijians had really no say in the introduction of Indian indentured labor in Fiji. There were some, uh, some um, rumblings in the 1880s. Uh, questions are being asked. What will happen to these people? India, 1879. Various methods are used to recruit indentured laborers from India. Everything from the promise of free passage back to India after working for a certain time period to outright kidnapping. I think that a certain amount of fraudulence is present in any form of labor recruitment. It happens even today, as you know. And I don't deny, you know, that people, some people were misled 
uh, some people were perhaps even kidnapped. But if you put the migration of, of these people in the context of what was taking place in 19th century India, then I think uh, kidnapping is not as big a factor as, 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 as some people made it out to be. Because as I mentioned, people were already on the move looking for jobs. And the, so people who came to Fiji or went to other colonies were part of, 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 this, of this mass of humanity looking for, for jobs. Now my own grandfather uh, was recruited for uh, Demerara, which is Guyana. But the ship was full. So he said, well, wait for the next one. And the next one was coming to Fiji, so he, he came to Fiji. So yes, I mean a lot of children came, and, and children of course were also born on the voyages out. The government was essentially looking for for people who, from working background, farmers, agriculturists, peasants, laborers and so on. They did not want high caste people. And yet really, um, in many cases, high caste people uh, 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 also gave uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the caste as, a, um, as one that it's a lower one, you know, rather than the, the true one, the, the, which was the caste. A classic example would be someone like Tota Ram Sanad. Tota Ram Sanad was a Brahmin. But because the government didn't want, uh, you know, people who didn't have that kind of agricultural experience, he registered as a Thakur. He came to Fiji in 1893, I think, uh, and worked in one in Bukasi, which is uh, in, you know, sorry, and went back to India sometime, I think in 19, 1914 or, or thereabouts, and wrote a very famous book called Fiji Me Mere Ki Swarsh. And the story that, the stories that he related in that book uh, provided a very powerful ammunition in the abolition of indenture. In 1893, Totaram Sananya comes to Fiji as a Girmichiya. In 1914, he returns to India and with Benasirdis Chaturvedi writes My 21 Years in the Fiji Islands, a powerful indictment of the indentured labor system and the treatment of Indians in Fiji. In India, the book is immediately translated from Hindi into several other South Asian languages. It becomes one of the most frequently used sources of information and argument during the public movement in India that led to the abolition of indenture in the 1910s, the movement Gandhi later called the First National Satyagraha. Tutaram Sandhyandha is born in Hirangau, in the district of Firozabad. His deceased father's assets are taken over by unscrupulous moneylenders. His elder brother leaves to earn money to support his brothers and mother. Still, the family lives in a very poor state. Seeing himself as a burden to his mother, Sanyanda also leaves home to look for work. A farmer finds the runaway boy and, taking pity on him, brings him to his home where he stays for two months. What happened if a laborer wanted to break his contract or tried to run away? Incessant gluttony for bound labor, even when free labor was available, was the characteristic response of the planters when they were in crisis. Once someone had signed a contract, there was no escaping the destiny of indentured labor, as Sanyanda's story demonstrates. One day, Sanyanda is recruited from the local market with the promise of an easy job with good pay. He is told to lie to the magistrate who registers him as an indentured laborer to increase his chances of being recruited. At the Calcutta depot, he changes his mind about going to Fiji, but he is incarcerated for attempting to breach his contract. Eventually, he must accept his fate, and he is bound for Fiji. He has written about the bad conditions on board the ship and likened his situation to being in prison. Sanyanda, together with 500 others, arrive in Fiji on board the Humnya. Altogether, 60,965 migrants came, uh, Indian migrants came from, uh, from India, of whom 45,439 
came from uh, or embarked at, at Calcutta and the remainder from Madras after 1903. 60,965 laborers were transported to Fiji, men and women embarking together on a three-month voyage in close living quarters is, for many of them, a violation of their caste system, serving to break down social barriers over time. When the cotton market falters with the end of the American Civil War, the planters switch to sugar cane. In the early years of the 1870s, Sir Arthur Gordon convinces them that their required labor lay in the villages of India and the indentured servants program. Why India? I mean, why they brought Indians? Britain was the colonial power in India, so it was a very large colony. Uh, indenture system was essentially a British system, where slavery was essentially Spanish, Portuguese, American uh, system. Uh, also, Indians were supposed to be docile and hard workers. It is also important to bear in mind that Sir Arthur Gordon, the first substantive governor of Fiji, had been governor of Trinidad and Mauritius before coming to Fiji. So he had already seen the operation uh, of the indenture system in these colonies before he came to Fiji. And, and, and you know, and, and he was, uh, it, it, it made sense uh, to turn to India because India, after all, was part of the British Empire. They are split into groups to be sent to different sugarcane plantations. When slavery was abolished in the British Empire in 1833, it was abolished in Fiji as well. The first of the coolies, or indentured laborers from India, arrive five years after Fiji gives itself to the British. The coolies are given the accommodations of the slaves they were replacing. Uh, and each plantation, or you, you know, there, there, there's lines all over Fiji. And you can still see a, 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 an existing structure of an old line in Ba. It still exists. One 10 foot by 12 foot room, six men to a room, or a man and his family. The term coolie applies to unskilled workers from Asia, particularly from China and India. What kind of medical care, educational opportunities, recreational opportunities, etc. were available? The British government established special schools for indigenous people. Two of the notable ones were the QVS, the Queen Victoria School, which was a specialized school for the chief's children. And then the RKS, the Ratukan Davulevu School, which was a specialized school for the second layer of indigenous Fijians children. So there were specialized schools for the indigenous people, there were special schools for the European and the part European people, people of mixed blood, but there was none for the Indians. The Indians had to establish their own schools through their own community effort. You see, later, by the early 20th century, you have associations uh, being formed to um, mosques are being built and temples are being built and so in that sense the institutionalization of religion begins to take place in the uh, from the beginning of the early 20th century and 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 in the 1920s and 30s of course these institutions uh, start schools uh, Fiji Muslim League, Sangam Sanatan Dharam, Ar Samaj and so on and, and, and they play a hugely important role in, 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 the, um, in the educational area, as they do uh, today. And uh, they're the ones who build the roads, who build the uh, railway for the whole of sugar cane from um, the farms to the mill. Uh, and uh, they uh, uh, worked in sugarcane plantations of CSR company in those days. And then of course, when the indenture period was abolished, uh, they worked as a small holders, planting sugarcane, supplying to, um, the FS, uh, to the CSR company. I am a fourth generation Girmitia. All that I know is from my reading and stories which have flowed down generation after generation. Yeah? Uh, obviously the conditions on the farms were very bad. Uh, there is a lot of literature on the violence 
own the estates where employers would beat them up, they will mistreat women, children, etc. Uh, it was a life of hell, in short. The terms of indentureship states five years, but ten years becomes the norm. In return, they will receive wages, cost of passage, and some minor benefits such as housing, clothing, food, and water. At the expiration of the agreed term, the laborers will be free to re-sign for another term, seek other employment, or return home. Well, they were paid by the CSR company, and the wages was one shilling a day, which in today's terms means ten cents a day, so it was one shilling a day. Those days, they were brought here for a period of five years, uh, well, ten years actually. Uh, after five, they could return to India, but they'll have to find their own fare. In Fiji, many stay to become peasant proprietors in this new country. According to the Indenture Act of 1912, when emigrants under indenture are ill, they will be provided with hospital accommodation, medical attendance, medicines, medical comforts, and food free of charge. And you have lots of reports of neglect and um, uh, insanitary conditions um, in these hospitals. Uh, I have no idea how regularly the, the migrants actually access the health facilities on, on plantations, but I suspect not very often. The Wreck of the Syria, 1884. At 8.30 p.m. on Sunday, the 11th of May, 1884, the Indian immigrant ship Syria, the fifth to reach Fiji, was wrecked on the Nasilai Reef. By the time the shipwrecked passengers were brought to safety, 56 immigrants and three Laskers, Indian seamen, had drowned. The Syria carrying 497 indentured adults, children, infants, and the crew of 43, including 33 Laskers, left Calcutta on the 13th of March, 1884. Its journey to Fiji seems to have been remarkably uneventful, except for a minor storm off the Cape of Good Hope, in which both the captain and the second mate allegedly lost their certificates of competency. The mortality rate of 0.8% on the voyage compared favorably with the overall average of 1% for the entire period. But perhaps the most astonishing feature of the trip was its length. 58 days, a record well above the average for sailing ships of 72 days. How, how do you think they made a mistake? I mean, you think they were drunk? The, the captain was drunk? Okay. No, the captain probably, probably is human error. Because at that time there's no radar, no GPS, you know. Stand by, Everything stand by, just... send one port. Once you said land, you say, okay, stop, put the sails down. Those ships had no engine. Came from the east, uh, so they came this way to Jakarta. All right? Mm. That's Sumatra, mm. that's Malaysia. Uh, they, Lopa. they came this way, Mike. Singapore, through Indonesia. Go, 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 go. There's Borneo there, Jakarta. They would have come. Uh, uh, I don't speak your name right now. Okay, that's Indonesia there. Okay, that's Australia. They would have come this way through the Gulf passing the north of the Gulf of Carpentaria, south of New Guinea, from here, straight into the Pacific, from here. See? They would have, uh, south of uh, the Solomons, north of Vanuatu, uh, straight to Fiji. Okay, when you zoom to Fiji. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay, they would come this way. Oh, from the okay. bottom. Yeah, the bottom. Okay. Because this year is a bit uh, too many uh, reefs. If they had came this way, then they would have stopped somewhere around here, see? 
probably waiting for daylight. See when they came that way? Yeah. Can be waiting around here for daylight. Okay. Waiting for daylight around here. Then somehow it probably just drifted. Hmm. Nice lay light to the wreck there. How many indentured laborers died in the course of their contracted service? Between 1884 and, and 1920, about 300 people committed suicide. May 14, 1879. The first 498 East Indians of 60,553 Girmurchias, or indentured laborers, arrived in Fiji on the labor transport ship Leonithas. They sailed from the port on the Indian Ocean in Calcutta on March 3, 1879, reaching Levuka over two months later. On this voyage alone, 17 would die of cholera and smallpox before reaching Fiji. 35 of the first 498 would die before ever grabbing hold of a shovel. Some died of exhaustion. The worst period uh, of, uh, you know, uh, for many Indian indentured migrants was in the 1890s. You see, disease claimed a huge number of, of, of lives. Hookworm and dysentery were the major killers of Indian men, women and children in the 1890s. Infant mortality was, was, was extremely high in the 1890s. I recall one year something like 25% of the children born died. Over the next five years, 87 vessels will bring this human cargo to the sugar plantations of Fiji. How many hours a day did they work for in the field? Were their contracts honored? According to the Indenture Act of 1912, number of days on which the emigrant is required to labor in each week, every day, excepting Sundays and authorized holidays. Number of hours in every day during which he is required to labor without extra remuneration. Nine hours on each of 12 consecutive days in every week, commencing with the Monday of each week, and 12 hours on the Saturday of each week. Oh, anywhere from nine to 14 hours. Every kind of work that your employer would tell you to do, from plowing the land, to cutting trees, to cultivation, to housework, cleaning, you name it. And if you refuse? Well, you had no option of refusing, because your meals depended on what you got as the wage from the employer. If you refused, what do you do? Some people did refuse and they ran off into the Fijian villages. In some places, the Fijian villages sheltered them uh, very willingly, but then the British government put in a law which made it illegal for the indigenous people to shelter those uh, workers who ran away from the farms. I mean, there are sensational cases of, of, of attempted rapes and so on. There was abuse of, of women, uh, not only in, 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 uh, in the depots, but in, on the plantations both by, by Indian men as well as by European overseers. There was abuse in the system, there is always abuse in, in, in these sorts of things, but I, I, I'd like to think that, you know, that, um, that uh, in the end, I mean, you know, uh, our people uh, w w survived. Not only survived, they triumphed. What was the indentured servant's day-to-day -day life like? The work bell rang at the barracks at 5 a.m. every morning along with the sardar's call to work. Out in the field, alongside the sardar, arrives the sahib, overseer or manager, dressed in hat and with a whip. He carries a workbook to quickly note who shall be deducted pay for short work, bringing even greater and constant pressure upon the laborer, who is no doubt lamenting how he came to be deceived. This distressing cycle is interrupted with Saturday payday, when men and women in gay dress receive their pay from the sirdar. The laborer contemplates how to carry on thus for five years, worrying about when he will be eligible for ticket of leave from the cane fields. The passage of time on the plantation 
and the constant anxiety led some to renounce their faiths, sadhu and fakirs, while others wandered in distress and anxiety, wondering how to carry on. Many indentured workers were advised and encouraged to remain patient and stay on the plantation, that it would be worth it, and besides, how different was it from their villages back home under the benign guidance of the Sirdars? The time and experience of plantation work for the Indian had the effect of overturning moral order. Many descended into moral anomie. Life in the Coolie Lines For the first six months, rations are provided by the estate, but Sananya finds that, because of the hard work he is doing, the ration is sufficient for only four days. For the other three, he either goes hungry or begs food from free Indians. He relies upon some trickery to avoid a full task. Faking an asthma attack during a medical examination, he is put on half task, doctor's orders. Although he suffers abuse from overseers, just like the other laborers, he is not afraid to fight back. Once, when he was punched by an overseer, Sanyandha tackled him to the ground and kept on hitting him until the overseer said that he had had enough. The overseer asked Sanyanta not to tell the details of the incident to anyone else, and from there on treated Sanyanta with respect. Though there were many small mills in the early beginning of the industry, by the 1890s the downturn in the price of sugar and poor management saw most of them close, leaving only three of CSR's mills and Fiji Sugar Unlimited in operation by the turn of the century. Did the Girmitias and the indigenous Fijians have much contact at this time? What would their typical interactions be? An indigenous population whose rights were protected at law. So we were not allowed to intermix with these people culturally and socially, which I think is hugely detrimental as far as the long-term future of this country is concerned. This complete isolation, encouraged by the government, but it also meant that our people, once their contracts had expired, they had to rely on their own resources. There was no government help at all. What were the indigenous Fijians' lives like at this time? Certainly cannibalism was prevalent, but that was centuries before the indentured workers came here. Very really simple, because our religion was a warlike religion in the olden days, before the Christian uh, missionaries came in 1835. Uh, that's where the Methodist Church uh, missionaries came in 1835. But before that, there had been other missionaries uh, attempts into the Lao group. Uh, before that, our religion was uh, was uh, uh, based on folklore, was based on chiefdom who uh, owed their chiefdom or their position to their tribal god. And appeasing the tribal god meant a lot of sacrifice. Not sacrifice of food, but sacrifice of human life. So if we were to continue with our old religion, I would have to go and kill somebody and sacrifice him to my tribal god who is a shark, throw him into the sea for the shark to eat, and I believe I'm appeasing <clears throat> my tribal god. So when civilization come, we couldn't uh, go on living like that because it was just not part of modern civilization. The third decade of the 20th century sees the passing of the indentured labor system into history. Now, the thing is that Christian missions try very hard, try very hard to proselytize among Indians. And the most prominent missionary, of course, is J.W. Burton. But our people refuse to convert, partly because of an exaggerated sense of pride in their own culture, their own history and heritage, partly also because they see um, 
Christianity as a religion of the overseer, religion of the CSR company, religion of the colonial government. The very same people who are oppressing, uh, oppressing them. So I think there is that link to be made. And the third factor is that the Christian missions largely focused their energies on Fijians. Fijian uh, uh, indigenous community and they realized and some of them despairingly said that these fellows would never convert it's a waste of time and they gave up a lot of people who came from India compared themselves to Lord Rama and his 14 years in exile like him they were stuck in Fiji hoping to one day return to their motherland Lord Ram and Indian people view white people as evil and consider themselves, as Lord Ram, exiles in Fiji. Diwali is the only festival the poor Gurmitias can celebrate. Ram is believed to be the earthly incarnation of the supreme protector Hindu god Vishnu. Although Ram was the rightful heir to the throne, to honor the wishes of one of his wives, to whom he owed his life, the Sarta banished Ram to the forest for 14 years and crowned Bharata king. Diwali, the festival of lights, celebrates Ram's return to Ayoda. And in that story, our forebears saw a rendition of their own predicament. They too were exiled, but they too would survive. That um, uh, truth, goodness will triumph over evil. So the Ramayana is a very important part of the cultural life of our people in the early years. By December 31st, 1899, the population was counted at 122,000 673. 98,478 native Fijians, 13,282 East Indians, and 4,373 Europeans. The rest of the population is a mix of Polynesians, Rotumans, half castes, and others. What happened to the indentured laborers after they fulfilled their contract? a free man and a pundit. After five years of indenture, Sanyanta becomes a free man. He does not have any money and owes 15 shillings. He borrows some money, leases some land and becomes a cane farmer. Eager to improve his skills, Sanyanta learns how to use a camera so he can photograph the atrocities being suffered by Indians and publish them in a newspaper but his camera is stolen. His suspicions are confirmed when he is barred from meeting with indentured laborers in most estates. Sanyanta knows that farming alone will not provide him with enough income, so he decides to become a pundit or priest. Soon he has a following in the Rewa area. What was the political situation in Fiji like at this time? There was no uh organized politics. Uh, uh, the first elected legislative council in only 1904. Uh, the first Indian representative on the legislative council as a nominated member is in 1916 and that's Badri Maharaj. Indians get a limited franchise in 1929 uh, but soon after they are elected they, they, they walk out because they want to have common role one person, one vote, one value. Uh, they return to, to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to politics, uh, to the Legislative Council. Um, and really from 1937 to 1963, the constitution of Fiji remains unchanged. What were the land lease agreements like? CSR company in those days owned a lot of land. They had leased or they had bought, on which they had their, their plantations sugarcane plantations which these indentured laborers were working on and uh, after the abolition of the indentured system 
um, F CSR realized that uh, uh, the best option for them was to subdivide this land into small holdings, small farms, and then lease it to these endangered laborers. 1904 to 1911. The Legislative Council, composed of six Europeans and two Fijians, declare Fijian lands alienable. By 1908, over 104,000 acres of fertile, accessible land is sold, while Europeans gain long-term leases to another 170,000 acres. When was the system of indentured labor discontinued? In 1911, the British Indian Association of Fiji is formed. The association discusses grievances such as the lack of educated leadership amongst the Indians and the dependence on European lawyers and authorizes Sanyanda to write a letter to Gandhi to send an Indian barrister to Fiji. Gandhi, moved by this appeal, publishes this request in The Indian Opinion, from where it comes to the attention of Manalal Doctor in Mauritius. In 1912, he sends a telegram to support Gokhale's resolution in the Legislative Council of India for an end to the indenture system. Manalal arrives in Suva on August 27, 1912. Manalal sets up a law practice, defending Indians for low fees, and writes letters and petitions for them. The government is suspicious of him, suspecting him of being Gandhi's agent in Fiji but still consults him on Indian affairs. Initially, Manalal works quietly to help the Indians, and the case of Veeraswamy is an example of his success in Fiji. Veeraswamy was initially employed as a telephone operator, but when he complained that he was not being given the promised job, he was sent to work in a cane field. He writes to the IIA, and Manalal forwards his case to the Anti-Slavery Society of London. The society approaches the colonial office and Veeraswamy is able to buy his freedom and get employment outside the indenture system. The government, instead of chastising the CSR and the immigration office, expresses annoyance with Manalal. The aim of the association was to watch the interests of and to assist in the general improvement of the Indian community in Fiji. As president of the IIA, Manalal writes to Gandhi, other Indian leaders, and the British Labour Party on the sad plight of Indian indentured labourers in Fiji. A lot of people call it passive resistance, but Mahatma Gandhi's passive resistance is very, very close to the border. Eh? Very, very close to the border. It was. Uh, maybe passive in nature because they were not offensive, but it was disruptive. So it was disruptive. What they were doing was disruptive to the uh, to the machinery of government at that time. Non-violent, but disruptive. So people sort of glibly say, "Oh, it was non-passive, non-violent." I mean, it was non-violent. It was passive. But when you look at it from, if you were the government, somebody was doing that, they'll be a, a thorn in your side, be irritating you. And I felt that the Indian, the, the British government in in uh, in India at the time was uh, was probably feeling that. But then he was persistent. He did that not only in India; he was doing it also in Africa. And while he was doing it, he was also thinking about the Indians in Fiji. The relationship between Manalal and the government worsens as conflicts over his attempt to build an office in Nausori leads to an organized conference with the Indian Imperial Association. After a meeting in Suva organized by Manalal's wife was violently broken up by the police, however, the situation worsens. By February 11th, all Europeans of military age were under arms. The telephone wires between Suva and Nausori are cut and there is a confrontation on Rewa Bridge between Indians and European special constables with fixed bayonets. 
On February 12th, a New Zealand force of 60 soldiers with machine guns arrive, and a warship arrives from England. On February 13th, the police and army hold a group of Indians at Samambula Bridge. After the incident at Samambula Bridge, the strikers gradually return to work. Historians argue the reasons for the end of the strike. Was it the presence of large numbers of armed security personnel? The government's willingness to use lethal force? Or an earlier call by Mrs. Manalal for those workers who had received a wage increase to return to work and the warning by Badri Maharaj to the strikers at a meeting in Nausori on February 15th of the danger of being led by agitators. In 1914, 30 years after the first indentured laborer agreements, gear meet, expire, 16,000 acres have been leased to Indians. March 27, 1914, Totaram Sandyantha leaves for India. His departure from Fiji is a major event, even gaining the attention of the European press. On his return to India, he tours different parts of India and also makes a speech at the Madras session of the Indian National Congress. He recites his story to Benarcidas Chaturvedi, who then wrote the book My 21 Years in the Fiji Islands in Hindi in 1914. In 1915, a number of Indians petitioned the governor to nominate Manalal as their representative in the Legislative Council. The government ignores these protests, claiming that Manalal was not eligible for nomination as he was born in Baroda and not a British subject. In Fiji, Manalal's attempts to help the downtrodden put him on a collision course with local authorities and is deported from Fiji and barred from practicing law in several colonies. Gandhi goes to Bombay to meet with Indian leaders there. They establish a date of May 31st 1917 as the last day for indentured labor. In 1918, J. A. McKay, a member of the Legislative Council, with the backing of other community members, inquires about the possibility of obtaining Chinese laborers. Now that India has abolished using their own people for indentured labor, the British Empire finds itself experiencing a labor shortage. The request is denied as the whole question of immigrant labor is under scrutiny. January 1, 1920, Governor Cecil H. Rodwell, following the tides of change in India and the world, cancels the indentured system on Fiji, freeing the Indian laborers. Uh, in the 1920s and 1930s, when Indians begin to demand a you know, common role and an equal franchise, equal franchise with, with Europeans, for example, you know, Europeans had six elected members when they were a tiny proportion of the population. And Indians had three when they were nearly half the population. So this disproportion was a cause of, of anger in the Indian community. With pressure from the government, CSR reaches an accord on a 10-year contract, which includes concessions by CSR and an increase in the price of cane. December 9, 1934, the Indian Association of Fiji is reformed, this time as the successor of the Fiji Indian National Congress. Its stated goal is to further and safeguard the political rights of Fiji Indians. A.D. Patel and Vishnu Deo will travel to England and India to protest of the upcoming proposals for a purely nomination system for selecting members to the Legislative Council. They will also lead a protest of restrictions to Indian immigration to Fiji. In 1939, when the Colonial Office urges instating an Indian representative on the Executive Council, Governor Sir Arthur Richards responds, a man may be highly representative of the petty trader, the petty shopkeeper, or the petty farmer, but if he also has the limitations of the petty trader, he would be useless as an advisor. 
Indians continued to be excluded on the Executive Council until 1945, when K.B. Singh becomes the first Indian appointment to the Executive Council. In 1948, with the backing of three of five Indians in the Legislative Council, A.D. Patel is appointed to the Executive Council, outmaneuvering his one-time friend and ally, Vishnu Deo. Changes in the Legislative Council lead to increases in the number of official and non-official members representing the three major ethnic groups, European, Indo-Fijian, and Native Fijian. Europeans who see the Indian demand for common role as simply uh, nothing more than a ruse to, um, to dominate because Indian numbers were, were exceeded Fijian numbers in, 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 in the mid-1940s. So the fear of Indian domination plays a huge role in, in, in consolidating Fijian and European uh, coalition, so to speak. By 1963, women are enfranchised and the indigenous Fijians finally are empowered with the right to directly vote for the representatives to the Legislative Council. The Legislative Council has now grown to 37 members, four of whom are elected for each of the three major ethnic groups. This will change one more time in 1966, with the Council consisting of 36 members, 10 elected Europeans, 12 elected and two appointed Fijians, and 12 elected Indo-Fijians. June 21, 1964, the National Federation Party comes into existence with A.D. Patel as its first president and S.M. Koya serving as vice president. January 10, 1965, the National Congress of Fiji is formed. Their leader is Iota Prasad. On the 21st of July, the Congress calls a meeting of the Fijian and European members of Legislative Council informing their guests of their intent to work with them in achieving a free Fiji. Indo-Fijians make demands for the immediate introduction of full self-government with fully elected, by universal suffrage on a common voters' roll, legislature. And I think that the Fijian leadership at that time uh, saw Indian demand for political representation as an attempt to, to take over which I think was, was, was mistaken because there's no, never any, any effort to sort of take over. What they were asking was, was equal representation, fair representation, representation for everybody. These demands are vigorously opposed by the native Fijian contingent with their fears of an Indo-Fijian dominated government controlling the lands and resources of Fiji. Demand for common role um, was, was, always, um, was always fraught but I think in the long run, that is the only way to go. To have a nation based on, not on racial you know, uh, lines, and politics and racial lines, but non-racial kind of, 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 of democracy. Uh, one person, one vote, one, one value, rather than keeping people compartmentalized in their ethnic sort of groups and so on. Uh, that's no way to build a, 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 a just, and fair nation. Well, let me put it this way: the Indians are very, uh, are very entrepreneurial in their attitude, and they are individualistic. You know, they will work hard for themselves, and when they, when you're working hard for your, for yourself, you have an objective, a self, uh, self-made objective. You know, I want to be that. In, in Fiji, everything is communally owned. We all work together. We sometimes cooperate and go and dig somebody's garden together, weed it together. So we're very communal. Uh, so, and our, our security, the feeling of security, a sense of security, comes out of how secure that communal entity is. And we feel that the communal entity of the indigenous Fijians is Fiji and can only be ensured or assured if we have an indigenous Fijian controlling Fiji or running Fiji or leading Fiji. Whereas the Indian, Indian uh, person, uh, if I'm successful and I, want to be, and I get to be prime minister, I'm prime minister for the, for the people. Uh, for the Fijians, they do not trust anybody else to look after their security. 
Finally understanding that they have no choice in the matter, the chiefs negotiate for the best deal available to them. On March 12, 1966, the General Electors Association, Suva Rotuman Association, Rotuman Convention, Chinese Association, All Fiji Muslim Political Front, Fiji Minority Party, Tongan Organization, joined with the National Congress of Fiji and the Fijian Association in forming the Alliance Party. And really from 1937 to 1963, the constitution of Fiji remains unchanged. It's only in 1963 that, in after 37, the constitution is changed. In 1960s is, of course, the, the era of decolonization, uh, when Britain wants to sort of sever its links with Fiji and end and, and colonial rule here. And there's a huge struggle going on. Uh, again, the, the Indian community, led principally by the late Mr. A.D. Patel, wants to have um, in the common role system of voting, uh, fair representation, and so on. 1967 brings changes when a full ministerial cabinet system is adopted that is fully responsible to legislature. Ratu Kamisese Mara is appointed the first chief minister, causing ethnic tensions to rise, as his alliance party is mostly a coalition of native Fijian and European factions. Consigned to the opposition benches, Patel leads nine other NFP legislators in a walkout over the new government's refusal to call a second constitutional conference in September. They miss two consecutive sections of legislative council and must forfeit their seats, forcing a special election. Interethnic violence increases as the election draws nearer. All nine NFP legislators are returned with an increased majority win. Arbitration proceedings for a new Kane contract begin on August 19, 1969. The result is the Denning contract, which awards the growers 65% and the millers 35% of the proceeds of all sales, including molasses, and a minimum price of $7.75 per ton of sugarcane. Uh, in fact, their indenture continued well beyond 1916. It was not until uh, uh, 1970, actually, or 69, that the cane farmers were actually uh, liberated from bondage. Although uh, they became free farmers in 1920. Uh, from 1920, for the next 50 years, uh, they uh, planted cane and, 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 and sold it to CSR company uh, at uh, a price which was an economy. So it filled the coffers of the CSR, but the farmer was only able to eke out a very subsistence kind of living from that income. It was only in 1970 that when Lord Denning who uh, was brought here to uh, uh, arbitrate on uh, a new cane contract that uh, the farmers received justice for the first time uh, and uh, there was a fair sharing of proceeds from the sale of sugar. A major stumbling block to Fiji's independence is the failure of native and Indo-Fijians to come together on a constitution for a free Fiji. The ethnic Fijians and Mara want communal franchise with parliamentary seats reserved for the different ethnic groups who would vote on separate electoral rolls. Most Indo-Fijians, however, oppose this proposal. They demand all parliamentary seats be elected by universal suffrage from a common voters' roll. In April of 1970, Siddiq Koya the leader of the mainly Indo-Fijian National Federation Party, and Mara meet in London to hammer out a compromise. Native and Indo-Fijians were to be represented equally in the House of Representatives with 22 seats each. Another eight seats were set aside for Europeans and other minorities. Half of the candidates would face only their race in the elections, while the other half would face election by universal suffrage. 
With this accord, the road to Fiji's independence from the Crown of England was finished. With Fiji's independence from Great Britain, on October 10, 1970, 